The cyclic rate of fire is 700 to 800 rounds per minute with a muzzle velocity of approximately 3,150 feet per second. All right, y'all, welcome back to the Commodore Arms channel. Okay, so today we're checking out a retro documentary about the M16. Now, I have used the M16 quite a bit in the Marine Corps, um, even used it a little bit in the Army, which was uh, unfortunate going back to that thing. Um, but yeah, honestly, it is a pretty solid freaking rifle. I actually have a civilian version of it right here. So this is the Colt Air 15A4, so same manufacturer, um, of the M16 that I used when I was in the Marine Corps. Uh, so yeah, I started off with the M16 A4 and that was a lot of fun. It was semi-automatic, it had three round burst. And at that point it had like a rail system and we can get ACOG on it. So it was pretty cool. The M16 that we're gonna check out in this video was very, very, very early on. Like this is literally right when they were getting it. And this is a training film that they were using to kind of get people spun up on it. Of course, originally in Vietnam, in the Vietnam War, they had the M14, which is uh, kind of longer, definitely heavier, um, and also just heavier caliber rifle. It had a 7.62 as opposed to the M16, which has a 5.56 kind of a uh, bigger bullet to a smaller bullet. A lot of people didn't like that. However, it was a lot lighter. You were able to carry more of the ammunition. Um, and I have one Vietnam vet's opinion about the M16, which I'll share a little bit later on. Um, but yeah, this should be pretty cool. Checking out these re retro documentaries and training films are always just kind of cool. But about the M16 is, is again, kind of personal to me because that was the first real gun I ever shot, actually. So let's go ahead and check it out. Classic music, grainy with the old school font. Kind of like a cartoonish font, but like with a cool drop shadow. The rifleman's effectiveness depends to a large degree upon his rifle. What is that? What military is that guy in? It and rugged as possible. It must be capable of automatic and semi-automatic fire, and its ammunition must provide maximum firepower with the minimum of weight to enable the rifleman to carry as many loaded magazines as possible and practical. Yep, and again, that was like a... What is this dude? What military is this guy in? Interesting, and what caliber is that even? Okay, but yeah, so that was a big focus on why they were trying to move to the 5.56 and the M16, because yeah, the M16 does have the sort of polymer handguard, polymer stock, as opposed to having the full wood stock like the uh, M14 had. Um, yeah, it's, it's a lot lighter. And of course the ammunition was a lot lighter as well. They didn't have the old, these are 30 round magazines. Back then they had 20 round magazines. So you could carry a bunch of those because I'll put up a comparison here. Um, but the comparison between a 7.62, which is what they used to have and a 5.56 is pretty substantial, which of course was kind of a point of contention but I think they pretty much got over it when they learned how much they can carry and also how good the 5.56 penetrated. For use in areas where extreme mobility is required and ammunition resupply is difficult, a new rifle has been issued to special forces, airborne and air mobile troops of the army and to other military forces of the United States. Hmm. This new rifle is designated the XM-15 <laughs> The old school kit too. Fun fact, so we actually had, I don't know if these are the exact mag pouches. It looks like it. When I went to boot camp, we had like literally the Vietnam era gear, like the old school nylon kind of web belt here, the like old school, like I think they were nylon magazine pouches with the black plastic clips. Um, yeah, it was pretty unfortunate to have to use that gear. But again, like kind of seeing these videos is cool because you kind of go back to your roots. And this is what they were watching when they were getting their new rifle, trying to figure out how to use it. Um, so it is kind of cool to be able to watch it now, having used the M16 for so long. The XM16E1 is a 5.56 millimeter or caliber .223 shoulder weapon. It is magazine fed, gas operated, and air cooled. Air -cooled. Hell yeah. You have to remember that in boot camp, actually. The magazine capacity is 20 <laughs> rounds. By closing the bolt and turning the selector lever to semi, the rifle will fire semi-automatically. It's such a smooth shooter, too. By turning the selector lever to auto, the rifle will fire full automatic. Hell yeah. 
The cyclic rate of fire is 700 to 800 rounds per minute. <laughs> yeah, he's really leaning into it now. But compared to the M14, I'm pretty sure the M14 was also still select fire. But I don't know how many people actually use the M14 in full auto. Let's be real, because that thing must have been a beast to try and manage. But yeah, uh, unfortunately, I don't have a select fire one. But I did use, again, the ones that we had in the Marine Corps, at least the ones that I had, um, was the M16A4, which was, um, it had semi-automatic and then also three-round burst. Uh, I've shot in full auto, mostly with M4s, but I've never shot a full auto M16. But I'd imagine it would be pretty freaking smooth because the three-round burst, like, was, was pretty smooth. And full auto on an M4 even is pretty smooth. With a muzzle velocity of approximately 3,150 feet per second, <laughs> the maximum effective range is 460 meters. The weapon's most distinguishing mm. characteristic is its light weight. When fully loaded with 20 oh, rounds, yeah. this weapon weighs less than 8 pounds. Hell yeah. The old school 20 rounders are pretty cool to, to get your hands on now too. This relationship of weight to firepower in the XM16E1 results from design, construction, and operation. One of its mm. principal features is straight line construction. The straight line extends through the stock, bolt carrier group, chamber, and barrel. Okay. This design substantial. Okay, so I guess like opposed to an AK or something where the stock is like angled slightly down, it might kind of pivot off of your shoulder a little bit more. Um, there's a lot of really awesome design features with like the M16, um, and that's kind of a, a weird one for them to point out. But let, let's hear what they have to say about it. It reduces rifle climb during firing. The barrel is surrounded by a heat-resistant fiberglass material with an aluminum reflecting shield which serves as a handguard. Yeah, it never really got too hot, to be honest, now that I think about it. Works pretty well. Vents along the upper and lower surfaces of the handguard allow for circulation of <laughs> air around the barrel. Still kind of the same principle here. The ejection port has a hinged dust cover to prevent foreign matter from entering the chamber through the ejection port. Yep, when the weapon also. is cocked or fired, the dust cover opens automatically for ejection of spent cartridge cases. Yep. Again, a really kind of cool feature there. Very simple, too. And then, yeah, in the Marine Corps, if you leave this open, you're kind of a turd. <laughs> of the oh, yeah. Due to the straight line construction of this weapon, raised sights are necessary. Maybe back then you would use it as a carry handle, but uh, like in the Marine Corps, if you had your M16 and you use this as a carry handle, um, you're gonna get some shit for sure. Um, so yeah, definitely not something that we, it's called the carry handle, but it wasn't used as a carry handle. Makes a lot of sense. That's a Marine Corps right there. Sorry. The rear side <laughs> it's is kind of awkward to carry like that the though. Carrying handle and is protected by the raised sides of the handle. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Additional designs can be seen in this view. One of these is the gas operating system. When a round is fired. Actually, let me bring it back real quick. So it looks like the carry handle also had a hole in it. So you can kind of see here, the carry handle has a hole in it. And that's for, at least like early on, um, when we had like the the original ACOGs, you could attach the ACOG and kind of, there's like a screw post device and you would attach the ACOG on top of the carry handle. So I don't know if that's what they were originally planning to use that, that kind of cutout for, but if that's the case, that's pretty good like for, for thoughts. Um, but if you guys know, Maybe what else that might have been used for, then let me know. But I know it's pretty, it was pretty much used for optics. Sides of the handle. Additional designs can be seen in this view. One of these nice. is Cut the away. gas operating system. Hell when yeah. a round is fired, gas passes through a gas port located in the front, upper surface of the barrel, mm -hmm. and is directed through a gas tube back into the cylinder formed by the bolt and bolt carrier, causing the bolt carrier to move rearward. Another yep. design is the chamber locking mechanism. It's called direct impingement. Lugs on the bolt lock the bolt directly to the barrel, thereby eliminating the need for the heavy receiver normally required to lock the bolt behind the cartridge. Hmm. Yep. Another, not not necessarily like a new design as far as I was aware, uh, at least with the AR or the M16. Um, but yeah, pretty nice design. Also kind of helps prevent some other weird kind of malfunctions, keeps it in battery, keeps it only firing when it's actually locked. Of course, there were some kind of weird kinks with the M16 originally, but it worked out pretty well. The stock of the rifle is composed of a durable synthetic material of high impact strength. 
It contains the recoil mechanism <laughs> consisting of the action spring guide and action spring. Yep. So the bulk carrier group A would kind of move into that. A portion of the recoil is absorbed by buffer rings located on the action spring guide. During recoil, the outer rings are forced to ride over the inner rings. Huh. A little bit of a different design now. A special feature of the XM-16 E1 rifle is the forward assist assembly. This permits the rifleman to seat the bolt manually in event <laughs> it fails to do so automatically. Yep. So that's why whenever you see somebody... Like, if they do a, a brass check, so if they sort of rack their rifle, the chamber around, they'll do a brass check to make sure that there's actually a round chambered, and then they'll do that, and they'll hit the forward assist just to make sure that the bolt is actually forward all the way. So if you see people doing that, that's kind of what you do. You're not supposed to just, like, lightly tap it. You're supposed to be kind of aggressive with it. The principal distinctive features of the weapon have been described. <laughs> Before learning how it functions, we will see how it is used. All right, let's do it. Using the weapon consists of three functions, loading, firing, and unloading. To load the magazine, remove Finger the, on the trigger <laughs> by pressing the magazine release button located above and forward of the trigger guard. Place mm -hmm. a round on top of the magazine follower, nose toward the smooth face of the magazine, and press down. Repeat until 20 rounds have been inserted. I mean, it's kind of the same with the Before old magazines, Before loading the weapon, too. place the safety selector lever on safe. Eh. With the weapon on safe, insert the loaded magazine into the magazine <laughs> feedway and push up. While we do it, <laughs> I love the, the trigger discipline that they're having here. But, okay, I mean, if they put it on safe, it's fine. But, yeah, not totally necessary. Let's be real. Especially if you're doing a speed reload, you're not putting that sucker a back on safe. A click will be heard when the magazine is properly seated. Yeah, so you had to insert and then to tug it the bolt and chamber the to round, make sure. Hold the charging handle fully to the rear and release, or press the bolt catch. Mm. The forward movement of the bolt strips around from the magazine and chambers it. To fire semi-automatically, turn the selector lever to the semi-position. The rifle will then fire around each time the trigger is pressed. To fire automatically, yep. turn the selector lever to the auto position. The rifle will continue to fire automatically <laughs> say that so as weird. long as the trigger is pressed to the rear or until the magazine Dude, is... Dude, that was like one burst in his M16. It was like already freaking feeling it. <laughs> as long grief. as the trigger is pressed to the rear. Yeah, so most of this is pretty similar to the M14. The only difference with the M14, you had to rock the magazine in. Um, but yeah, even still, once you'd rack it, it didn't really have like... I mean, this isn't really an ambidextrous. Most aren't really ambidextrous like... Uh, charging handles you still need to kind of like rack it from one side uh, but it's easier to get to but yeah with the m14 pretty much the same you'd rack it you'd release it would strip the round from the magazine so not a whole lot of difference but it is also a training film so it's probably used for people who didn't really have experience with the m14 either. Here, or until the magazine is empty to unload the weapon first place the selector lever on safe Put Remove your on the, the magazine trigger. by pressing the magazine <laughs> release button. Remember, the rifle is clear only when the bolt is to the rear. There is no round in the chamber, the magazine is removed, and the selector lever is on safe. Yep. Although the configuration of the... Or you have some people who... Uh, actually, there's a video. I'll put it up here. People who would just drop the magazine and then... They'll think that's clear, and then they'll pull the trigger and <laughs> send a round down range. The XM-16E1 is distinctive. Its cycle of operation and functioning are similar to other military rifles with automatic capabilities. <laughs> Grab that carry handle. All right. <laughs> the cycle of functioning of the weapon consists of eight basic mechanical operations. Okay, These yeah, so it's the same. Firing. Unlocking. Extracting, extracting, ejecting, ejecting, cocking, cocking, feeding, chambering, locking, feeding, chambering, and locking. Bit of a different order than what we learned. Although many learned, of these occur but... simultaneously, they will be discussed separately for both semi-automatic and automatic fire. This is also something like you'll have to learn the cycle of operations when you're in boot camp 
because I don't know, you just need to learn everything about kind of your weapon system, which is good. It's a good practice. Understanding the max effective range, the max range, the slack of operations, the characteristics, good to know for sure. Let's start with firing. Are we going to? I hope we get the cutaway. When yes, the these timber, are so cool. The weapon is ready to fire. For semi-automatic fire, the selector lever is turned to the semi position. Okay, <laughs> fancy. Alright, so they're going to show us, they're going to drop the hammer. Yep. Assuming that the hammer is in the cocked position to begin with, the firing cycle is initiated by pressing the trigger. The trigger rotates on the trigger pin and disengages from the notch on the bottom of the hammer. The hammer moves this is forward very by action depth. of the hammer spring. This is a little more, this is almost like armor level kind of knowledge. Um, I mean, it is kind of good to know like uh, what a seer is and what the hammer is and like kind of that stuff. But like as far as the pins and the Show notches. The hammer spring. It's cool to see though. It I haven't seen the head this yet. Of the firing pin and drives it through the face of the bolt into the primer, which ignites the powder. Yeah, pretty much nothing has changed with that. The next three operations in the cycle occur in rapid sequence as an immediate consequence of firing. First of these is <laughs> okay. unlocking. Before firing, the bolt has been locked into the barrel extension. By mm -hmm. alignment of the lugs on the bolt and barrel extension. This is so cool seeing the actual cutout. When the round is fired, gas from the burning powder forces the projectile through the barrel. They have to do it in like the slowest motion possible. <laughs> well, now we get to see all the gas is kind of A coming out. A small up. portion of gas enters the gas port in the upper part of the barrel under the front sight. Yeah. So you'll have, you'll have piston firearms, which kind of, you have a whole piston set up. So the gases really aren't coming all the way back into the weapon itself those gases are basically uh, acting with that piston and that piston is cycling the weapon. But when you have a, a setup like this, which is, you know, the same as this AR here, you have a lot of that carbon kind of following all those gases. So it gets pretty dirty in here. If you have like a piston setup where, you know, the gases aren't coming all the way back, um, not going to be as dirty. The gas port directs gas into the gas tube, which carries it into the cylinder between the bolt carrier and the bolt, and drives the bolt carrier rear. Pretty cool animation. Yeah, so it connects right here, and then that drives this backwards. During this rearward movement, a cam track on the upper surface of the bolt carrier acts on the bolt cam pin. Rotating the cam pin and bolt clockwise until the bolt locking lugs are no longer in line mm. with the barrel extension locking lugs. That's so cool. During unlocking, the firing pin is withdrawn from the face of the bolt by the bolt carrier group. With the bolt unlocked, the next sequence in the cycle of operation occurs. This is extracting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you need to understand if, if this isn't actually locked forward all the way, I mean, it, it shouldn't fire anyway. The firing pin shouldn't, uh, engage. it wouldn't really engage properly. Um, but if this isn't locked in all the way, then if, you know, you have gases coming back into the weapon, that's when you have rifles uh, exploding, which is not ideal. Uh, I've had kind of firsthand knowledge with that. <laughs> the extractor is contained in the front end of the bolt. It grips the rim of the cartridge and holds it firmly against the face of the bolt. When the bolt carrier and bolt move to the rear, the extractor gripping the cartridge case withdraws it from the chamber. Hmm. The action of the gas will be repeated. When the round is fired and gas pressure pushes the projectile through the barrel, a small <laughs> portion of this pressure enters the gas port and passes through the gas tube. Yep into the cylinder between the bolt carrier and the bolt. Here, gas drives the bolt carrier rearward, unlocking the bolt and extracting the cartridge case. When the cartridge case is extracted from the chamber, the next operation can occur, ejecting. Hmm. The bolt contains an ejector and ejector spring which are compressed by the base of the cartridge. When the spent cartridge case is entirely clear of the chamber, the ejector spring forces the ejector forward. This action ejects the cartridge case out of the rifle through the ejection port. 
And again, a lot of this stuff might seem like pretty mundane, but if you kind of understand like why the rifle is doing certain things or what components affect certain things, that's when you know like, okay, if I see the casings are barely coming out of the actual chamber or if I'm getting a lot of the casings getting stuck in, there's probably an issue with the extractor or the ejector because you know, like those casings aren't getting kicked out as, you know, as well as they should be. Or likewise, if for whatever reason the weapon isn't getting enough gas to cycle properly, there might be something wrong with the spring, there might be something wrong with the actual gas tube. Um, so it kind of allows you to dissect things a little bit better. Uh, for the most part, the issues are pretty consistent uh, as far as what you're seeing. Um, you see an issue with the magazine more than anything, but it is kind of good to know this stuff so you can kind of dissect it, especially in the field when your weapon's getting kind of jacked up. With each firing, the bolt carrier and bolt are driven rearward by the force of gas. This rearward movement, in turn, initiates the sequence of unlocking, extracting, and ejecting. Hmm. So cool. You can even see the magazine spring pushing up the follower in the rounds. During the rearward movement of the bolt carrier group, another action occurs. Cocking. As the bolt carrier group moves rearward, it overrides the hammer and forces it down into the receiver, compressing the hammer spring. Hmm. The lower hook of the hammer is engaged with the disconnect. Also good to know if you're building your own AR too. When the trigger is released, <laughs> the hammer slips from the disconnect and is caught by the nose of the trigger. The weapon is cocked. Another simultaneous action occurs during the rearward movement of the bolt carrier group. Oh, we get to see the spring. This action is called feeding. As the bolt carrier group clears the top of the magazine and expels the empty cartridge case, a new round is pushed into the path of the bolt by the upward thrust of the magazine mm -hmm. follower and... <laughs> you saw how the, uh, the round kind of tilted there? Um, so let's see if I have one. Yeah, so I have one here. So earlier magazines had a follower that could tilt basically like this. So as it was loading certain rounds, you would have an issue with the rounds not getting, basically they're not oriented in the correct direction. So they, they eventually started including anti-tilt followers. So like this would never do any of this tilting stuff. So it was always consistently pushing that round or you know feeding that round from the same angle. So it was a lot more reliable and you'd have issues in the Marine Corps. You'd get a magazine, you check the followers, they'd be like, oh, it's a green follower, it's a piece of crap because it's doing all this stuff. And it is kind of annoying, like when the round's not feeding properly, then yeah, it's it's probably going to be a routine issue, and especially with the magazines. And usually it's not a whole lot you can do besides just get new magazines. Spring. The action spring guide, which is pushing on the rear of the bolt carrier group, is forced rearward by the bolt carrier group, compressing the action spring. The bolt yep. carrier group reaches its rearmost position when the rear of the action spring guide contacts the rear of the receiver extension. Action spring guide, okay. I'm not sure. Now the yeah, compressed it's a little bit of a different setup. Expands. This drives the action spring guide <laughs> assembly forward with enough force to drive the bolt carrier group forward toward the chamber. This initiates the next action in the cycle of functioning, chambering. And of course, if the round doesn't have like as much gas as it needs or as much kind of powder or explosion, basically as you're expecting, and there's not as much gas kind of acting on that bulk carrier group, it's gonna start messing everything up and you're not gonna get feeding, you're not gonna even get locking sometimes. Um, so it's gonna be a lot of kind of weird jacked up things happening. As the bolt carrier group moves forward, the face of the bolt strips a new round from the magazine and moves it toward the chamber. Hmm. It's so cool to see all these cuts. I wonder how much one of these cut out like M16s would go for nowadays. As the extractor grips the rim of the cartridge, the ejector and ejector spring are forced back into the bolt by the base of the cartridge as the round is seated in the chamber. Now one final action is required to complete the cycle, locking. 
The forward movement of the bolt ceases when the bolt locking lugs pass between the barrel extension locking lugs and the round is fully chambered. Even the Desert Eagle, uh, Desert Eagle is a pretty unique pistol, but even the Desert Eagle features a very similar sort of bolt setup where, you know, it's got like the compression of the bolts and of course the locking itself. So very similar setup if you guys haven't seen how Desert Eagle actually looks when it's like racked back. Carrier enters the last half inch of its forward movement the bolt cam pin emerges from the guide channel in the upper receiver, moves along the cam track, rotating the bolt counterclockwise. Hmm. This locks the bolt to the barrel extension. Locking the bolt completes the cycle of operation. The weapon is ready to be fired again. When the selector lever is on semi-automatic, as it has been during this review of the cycle of functioning, a single round is fired each time the trigger is pressed. When the selector lever is moved to the auto position, the weapon functions in a slightly different manner. <laughs> yeah, I would say. <laughs> the automatic sear holds the hammer in cocked position until it is struck by a shoulder on the bottom of the bolt carrier. This releases the hammer. As long as the trigger remains depressed, <laughs> The nose fails to engage the hammer, and automatic fire continues until the magazine is empty. However, yep. when the trigger is released during firing, the nose of the trigger moves up, engaging the hammer. The cycle of automatic fire is stopped until the trigger is pressed again. Hmm. So it seems, again, it seems so simple, but it's like really cool. All when other you can operations break it down. in automatic fire are the same as in semi automatic fire. These are firing. Unlocking. All right, all right, we get it. We get it. Extract cycle of it. functioning of the XM15 <laughs> E1 rifle. Man, they're really trying to drill it into these privates' heads. Understandable, though. Remember, from the, NCO the perspective. XM16 E1 is a gas-operated, air-cooled, shoulder-fired weapon, capable of semi-automatic or automatic fire. He wasn't even looking straight. He was looking down at the weapon. It fires 5.56 <laughs> millimeter ammunition, fed from a 20-round magazine. The weight of the loaded aluminum magazine is seven tenths of a pound. <laughs> okay. Good to the know, weight of I guess. the loaded weapon is seven point six pounds. Its maximum effective range is four hundred sixty meters. Drilling that those details the into your head again. Construction helps to assure accuracy of fire by reducing muzzle climb. I wonder where they actually filmed this too. Okay. In military situations requiring a high degree of individual mobility, together with the most possible small arms firepower per man, the XM-16E1 rifle has proved its value. Has it already? By 1966? Well, I, I don't even know. How long has it been in use at that point? Probably not a whole lot. Okay, so as far as that, that anecdote, so... There was a Vietnam vet um, who was like a family friend growing up. Really, really awesome dude. Kind of motivated me to join the military, to, if I'm being honest. Like, just super cool, super humble. Uh, and he, he also had a Purple Heart because um, he was in the Navy. He did like the kind of river patrols um, and was hit by an RPG. And, uh, yeah, I kind of jacked up his leg. But super cool dude. I remember what he was telling me about the M16. I must have been like nine at this point i was already kind of motivated to join the military and i was asking him about the m16 uh because i was probably playing like call of duty or some <laughs> or something at that point but yeah i asked him about the m16 i was like so what what, what did you guys think about the m16 and he said he didn't really like it because like when you'd hit the enemy with it so with the plastic stock they would laugh at you as opposed to the old m14s with like the wooden stocks really kind of hefty I, I, i'm not sure if that's true or not i wouldn't put it past him because dude is kind of a badass um but yeah it just seemed kind of funny like you get this this weapon i think he was describing it as like a toy it felt like a toy almost after having like the m14 so yeah that's kind of what i was thinking about the m16 uh kind of growing up but of course nowadays you have weapons that are as lightweight as possible and you know you always try and people like skeletonizing all the stuff too which um uh, can get a little bit out of control if I'm being honest, but yeah, so that was kind of my anecdote with the M16 But yeah, I, I love the M16. I really don't have a whole lot of bad things to say about it Besides how long it is when you have used other stuff <laughs> Yeah, but even though it is a very long weapon 
it's still like one of the smoothest shooting weapons ever. I mean, 20 inch barrel, the rounds going like stupid fast. I mean, it just soaks up that recoil. Like it's no issue whatsoever. So yeah, it's, it's like pleasant. It's like really, really fun to shoot this rifle, which is kind of weird considering there's like many explosions happening inside of it. Um, but yeah, it's just, as firearms go, these are some of the smooth, smoothest shooting firearms I've ever used. Uh, and again, like not necessarily ideal, especially in the Marine Corps when we were kind of trying to focus more on urban combats and trying to bring this thing through a doorway, not ideal. However, like once you go to the rifle range, cause we would shoot at like 200 yards out to 500 yards, and this thing standing up, very easy to shoot. Again, lightweight, so you can kind of carry this thing all day, which in boot camp uh, you will, and you'll be carrying it usually doing stuff like like this. <laughs> um, so yeah, having that lightweight weapon was very, very nice. And again, shooting out to 500, like once you get this thing set up in a good prone position with the sling kind of tied around your, your arm or whatever, like 500 yards is very, very easy. Like you're gonna shoot groupings like this pretty consistently so yeah just a great firearm and again it's been quick math uh, almost 60 years and the ar platform is still going very very strong uh, and you'll see a lot of militaries a lot of police adopting the ar platform and it really hasn't changed much i mean you'll see maybe more piston designs um, as opposed to direct impingement where you have the gas tube and all the gas is going down here but again like for the most part it's still going very strong pretty much as legendary as the AK-47. Um, and again, you'll have a lot of other firearms basing their designs and cycle of operations off of the AK-47. Um, and you know, this is no difference. You will have some militaries out there that still use some weird stuff like the L-85 or the AUG. The AUG is a little bit cooler. Um, but I wanna know what you guys think. If you guys ever shot an M-16 specifically, let me know what you thought about it, especially compared to other rifles that you might've shot or kind of used before. But let me know what you think about the AR platform in general compared to other stuff you might have used. Again, especially for those foreign military guys where you're not really, uh, if the AR platform isn't your, you know, your service weapon, might be kind of weird to handle it for the first time. Um, but again, for me, I still remember the exact feeling of shooting the M16A4 for the first time when we were on the rifle range, just feeling like, you know, what the heck? That, that wasn't really a whole lot of recoil. Hearing the spring, kind of feeling the spring, um, yeah, it was just, it was smooth from day one and it, it's just continuing to impress me by how fun it is to shoot this thing. Uh, but yeah, let me know what you guys think. Um, hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. If you have any other cool documentaries or training films, definitely throw them my way. Cause even if I don't do a reaction, I'll still want to check them out because these are always so cool to kind of see like our history and, and how they were trying to train people, um, with these, which we kind of saw was a lot of repetition. Um, but yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed, but yeah, that is, uh, that's it for this video. I will see y'all in the next one.